All right, hello everyone. My name's Curran. I'm going to talk about visualizing the universal data cube. So, there's this concept of the Akashic record. The Akashic record is an, like an ancient concept of a record of everything that ever happened on Earth. So, I mean, it's kind of a far out concept, but you know, everything actually did happen to get us to this point today. You know, the Big Bang and then evolution of life on Earth, and then people doing all kinds of things, doing business, people being born, people dying, people living out their lives. And uh, in this book called Mirror Worlds, this guy David Galertner, who's a computer science professor, he, he described this, this notion that computers will eventually understand the world and everything that's happening in the world, like all the details of everything that's going on. And of course, computers can't really know about everything that's going on, but they can know about some certain things. And um, with this notion of big data today, where computers are constantly collecting information about everybody's activities, uh, we're kind of approximating these mirror worlds that he described. So when you have Big data. So big data means, you know, it's really big. It doesn't fit on one computer, and it's maybe updating all the time. And uh, so there's this great paper, Immens. It's a system for visualizing big data. And in this paper, the authors describe these reduction methods for big data. So if you have data that's too big to analyze directly, you can reduce its size so that it can fit in memory and eventually fit into your, something in your head that you can comprehend. So there's various ways of doing this. Uh, you can filter the data, like for example, only look at what happened today, or only look at what happened in Massachusetts, rather than the whole universe of all time. Uh, that's filtering. You can sample the data, meaning you could randomly select a subset, just a few points, a few events, but then you miss out on a lot. And you might miss outliers, for example, if you sample. Uh, and then there's model-based abstraction. For example, uh, statistical summaries. Like if you have a big set of data and you take the, the mean, the median, and mode, that's a model-based abstraction for reducing big data. And then there's hybrid reduction methods that combine elements of both. For example, box plots. They use a statistical model to produce the box, but then some box plots include outliers that are outside the box. So that's combining filtering and hybrid reduction methods. But what I find is the most interesting one is binned aggregation. And that's because binned aggregation fits really well with data visualization. So what is binned aggregation? So this is the concept of binned aggregation. These points here represent maybe individual events that happened in time or individual things in space. And if you, if you impose a bin structure on the space of data, you can aggregate those individual events or things into bins and do things like counting or averaging of certain properties. So in this example, you know, two points fall into this bin, zero points fall into this bin, four points fall into this bin, and one point falls into each of these bins. So this is binned aggregation in one dimension. Um, and one example of binned aggregation in the real world and the world of uh, data is imagine, uh, consider the population of India, China, and the US. These are the three largest countries on Earth. And so going back to this, if you consider each person in the world as one of these little dots. And each country, the boundaries that humans have drawn around countries as the bins, computing the population of each country is kind of a bin aggregation. So th these are the populations of these various countries. And the countries are bins, people are aggregated into the bins. So this is still one dimension. And when I say dimension, that is a, uh, like a categorization scheme of binning. But you could also do bin aggregation in two dimensions. So here we, we've imposed a two-dimensional grid of bins. And again, you can count how many dots are in each bin. 
so this is two-dimensional bin aggregation. And in the data world, you can add time to this data about population. So here we have a two-dimensional bin aggregation structure where we're looking at the population of these three countries at two points in time, in 1950 and in 2010. And you can extend this bin aggregation idea to higher dimensions, like you can have three-dimensional bin aggregation for example, a data table with the place, the time, the population, and also adding the gender, like splitting the data along gender. So you have the same data set as before, but just splitting, you know, male and female. So this is adding a dimension. And you could do it in four dimensions. And a four-dimensional uh, structure, uh, which is a data cube. Bind aggregation produces data cubes as the structure. Uh, but an example of a four-dimensional data cube is place, time, gender, age range, and population. And um, this kind of data has been visualized in this great project by Martin DeWolf. I want to just highlight. So th this is a population pyramid that shows different age ranges. So these are zero to four years old, five to nine years old, and so on, different age groups, male, female, and then uh, this is just for 2015, so you can change in time and go back to like 1990 and see how the shape changes, and this is for the entire world. And so if you look at, uh, for example, Western Africa, you can see how uh, the shape changes. There's more young people. People die earlier, basically. And uh, the f further back in time you go, the earlier people die, generally. Uh, and if you, you, if you look at Western Europe, you can see that there are more older people. So this is one example of visualizing the structure where it's place, time, gender, age range, and population, a four-dimensional data cube. And you, you could also extend the idea to five dimensions. I mean, just because it's called a data cube doesn't mean it's three dimensions. Cubes are three-dimensional, right? But a data cube could be n-dimensional. So this is, for example, if you add ethnicity to that data set. You can slice, you know, multiply the data in terms of this other slice of ethnicity, or religion, or industry, what industry people work in. So you can sort of extend this as much as you want. And there's data out there that have very high dimensional structures. Um, so bin aggregation grouping things into bins and doing things like counting or uh, averaging produces these structures called data cubes. So data cubes are also called OLAP cubes, online analytical processing cubes. And um, there are various operations you can do on OLAP cubes or data cubes. One is slicing. Slicing is, let's say you have a three-dimensional data cube that includes years. And, but then you just look at the data for one year. You get rid of the data for all the other years and you look at one year only. This is called slicing, and it effectively reduces the dimension by one. So in the, in the resulting slice, there's no, it's only for one year, so there's no variation along years. So you don't really need to account for that as a dimension of the data when you analyze it or visualize it. And then there's uh, dicing, slicing and dicing. Uh, dicing is similar to slicing, but you might include more than one. So you st it doesn't change the dimensionality of the cube, but it reduces, like say you could select uh, a few years or a few regions only of the data. And then there's another kind of operation, drill down and drill and, and roll up. Uh, because dimensions, like we've talked about time and space as dimensions, these could be hierarchical. And drilling down sort of zooms into the hierarchy of the structure. And rolling up is the opposite. It's kind of zooming out of the hierarchy structure. Um, so here's another example of a data cube, which is uh, sales data about uh, various products, coffee, espresso, tea, herbal tea, along time, like along different, uh, at different quarters and in different regions. And so you can project it 
aggregate it along all locations, and then project it further, aggregate it along all products, and then project it further, aggregate it into all time. So this is taken from a paper, a really great paper, by uh, Stolte, Tang, and Hanrahan about multi-scale visualization using data cubes. So they give a really good introduction of what the data cube structure is and how they visualize it. Uh, they, they, they use this uh, zoom lattice kind of structure where you can do semantic zoom in the visualizations along hierarchical dimensions. Uh, for example, a map that's just the US states, you can zoom in and it shows the US counties, and then you can zoom in more and it, it shows some labels. So this is one example of visualization of data cubes in the literature. So let's consider this data set of population of all the countries of the world from 1950 until 2010. This is released by the United Nations and is made available as a spreadsheet. So this is some work that I've done uh, to visualize this data. And we'll revisit, revisit these things more with more context, but I just want to show you, uh, you know, the kind of work that I've been doing. So one way to visualize this data is as a timeline. So here goes from 1950 till, well, it only shows 2005, but it goes till 2010. And you can see that the population of the entire world, so this line represents the entire world. So this is a slice of the cube that's only considering the whole world over time. So it goes from like two and a half billion to seven billion. You know, it more than doubled in the past 50 years. The population on Earth more than doubled. Isn't that a wild thought? <laughs> Scary. <laughs> so this is one slice, but if you were to uh, consider all the countries and plot each country as its own line, it would look like this. India, China, and the US are the largest three countries on Earth. And the all, the, all the other ones are kind of uh, less than 0.2 billion. But this, this is just showing variation over time and each country as a line, but really a more appropriate way to show countries might be uh, on a map. So here's some work that shows the same data on a map and a timeline at the same time. So right now the map is showing data for 2010. But if you move the mouse along the timeline, it redefines the slice of data that's being used as input to the map. So you can see how even in 1950, uh, the US and China and India were the largest countries. And as time progresses, you can see how the population of other countries has grown over time. So the interaction here is you can hover to redefine the slice, but when you go back, it, uh, it goes back to whatever it was before. But then you can click. You can click on a certain year, which kind of pins it to that year. So now it's showing the population data for 1970. And uh, you can also hover here. And hovering shows you the population for that particular place at that particular time. But it also highlights it on the, on the timeline. So for example, if I hover over India, you can see how that line changes color. This is linked views, where interaction in one view influences the other view. Uh, and you can also zoom in on the map. And zooming in on the map, uh, dices the data that's shown in the uh, timeline. So the lines that are shown here are the regions that are visible on the map that you've currently zoomed into. So if you zoom out, you see all the countries of the world, but if you zoom in, uh, you can, it only shows a certain subset. So that's one example of visualizing a data cube about population. And I tried to visualize this other data cube about uh, causes of death. Because I wanted to kind of get at, like, what is it that's going on on the Earth? Like, humans are populating the Earth like crazy. 
Uh, but how, and we, we're born and we die. How do we die? So here are all the various ways that people die. Uh, visualized as a tree. Um, so cancer has a lot of subdivisions. Uh, influenza and pneumonia. Um, heart disease has a lot of subdivisions. So this is just showing the tree structure of the cause of death dimension. So this is a dimension of a data cube. And you can visualize the same data, uh, but over time, as a stacked area plot. So here, each region is one cause of, it's one top level category of, cause, of a cause of death. So you can see that cardiovascular diseases are the top cause of death. Second is uh, cancer, and then respiratory diseases, and the other ones are all kind of small. Uh, but this is only showing the top level. So how can we use uh, visualization to, to show all the data, to be able to explore the entire data set that spans the whole hierarchy of causes of death, but also shows you how it varies over time? So to do this, again, we can use two visualizations in conjunction with each other. These are called linked views. So here, uh, this shows the hierarchy from all causes to this, these top level categories, and that's what's shown over here. Each category is one area. But then if you click, like if I click on cancer, it drills down into the hierarchy uh, to the various types of cancer. So now you can see how various types of cancer uh, change over time in terms of how many people die. Uh, and you can, you can zoom in further to, you know, leukemia, and then zoom back out by clicking this other one, the top level um, dot right there. And car cardiovascular diseases, you can look, heart disease, stroke, hypertension. So this lets you explore the entire data set using linked views. So those are some uh, particular examples. I just wanted to get you familiar with the whole idea of visualizing data cubes. But what is really going on there? How does that stuff work? And what, it, what, was, what is this dissertation really about? So the vision here I'll describe the vision of, of what I want to accomplish. So here's the reality is we have many data sets like population, causes of death, uh, GDP, infant mortality, you know, the list goes on and on and on. There's hundreds, thousands of data sets that are out there available on the web. But you can't really look at all of them easily because each one is in a different format uh, or has a different structure. And so you need to do a lot of legwork to clean it and reformat it to, to visualize it. And then you have to, you know, hard code, usually what people do is hard code visualizations to a particular data set. So here's the reality. There's data sets, uh, there's many different data formats, like CSV or Excel or PDFs or in a relational database. Once, somebody once said that PDFs is where data goes to die. <laughs> and then there are many visualization tools so by visualization tools, I mean a particular technology like Tableau or Excel or uh, D3, the JavaScript visualization library. And the tools can only consume certain data formats. Like, not every tool can consume all data formats. And then there's visualization techniques. So what I mean by visualization technique is sort of an abstract way of visualizing data, like a scatter plot is a visualization technique. It's independent of any any particular tool, any particular technology. It's kind of a, you know, a eternal concept of how you can visualize the data. So scatterplot, bar chart, parallel, parallel coordinates, uh, choropleth map, a tree hierarchy, all of these uh, are visualization techniques. So the reality is it's very fragmented and it's not easy to take an idea of a scatterplot and, and apply it to any given data set that you want that's out there. It takes a lot of work. And so what I want to do is make it easier. This is the ideal, where any data set could be visualized with any visualization technique that you choose. So you should be able to imagine, like, oh, I want to show a scatter plot of population by GDP, and just you know, instantly make it happen in like 10 minutes. But as it is now, you've got to spend days working on it. And then what you have in the end is not generalizable. It's like a hard-coded thing. So this is the solution that I came up with for this is have this data model, like a framework for representing the data 
And this is, I call, I'm calling it the universal data cube because it can represent uh, pretty much any data cube that you throw at it. And data cubes represent the universe. I was saying before, the Akashic record, like the record of all the stuff that's ever happened, can be aggregated into data cubes using binned aggregation, and then you have something comprehensible that you can visualize directly, the data cube structure. So the universal data cube is this data model where you can import all the data sets into this co coherent model and integrate them all together. And then I've come up with this architecture for visualizations that I'm calling reactive data visualizations. And it's a way of making reusable plots. And the reusable plots can fit together really well with, the, with these data cubes. And so, you know, using these two elements in between the data sets and the visualization techniques, uh, this is how I propose to make it easier to visualize any, any data that you want with any visualization technique that you, that you think of. So the universal data cube, uh, a framework for representing and integrating data cubes. So here's the overall idea. You have different data sets that are published independently, and they may use different identifiers, or they may be scaled differently. Um, but they can all be integrated together into a coherent structure and then visualized using interactive visualizations with linked views. Yeah, the question is, it takes a long time for this to happen. Uh, yeah, I mean, this process of getting a PhD is like, I'm not going to actually do all this. It's more like there's a vision, and I can make small steps to get there. And like, you're right, it's not going to happen. All the thousands of data sets are not going to be overnight integrated together. It's going to take a lot of work. But what I'm proposing is kind of a, a framework, like a pipeline, to, to make this happen incrementally. You know, so I, I've done like one, two, three, and I want to make it easier for people in general to integrate uh, data sets together over time. Yeah, that's true. So the question was, you don't, you don't know what you're going to do with the data. But I, but I want to be sure that when I put it in this... So you want to be sure you don't lose anything in the data? I mean, I don't mean... Right. I mean, there, it is, you do lose something. Data cubes can't represent every single data set. So the, the, you make a point about lossiness. Like, data cubes only represent bin degradation and nothing else. So the data in the world is actually much richer than this. Data cubes are an approximation. Like, they're just a summary of what happened. So you're right. I mean, if you want to visualize, like, a, a social network and how it evolves over time, this is not the right way to do that. This, data cubes only apply to certain areas. Uh, but there's a lot of data that does fit into here. And most of the public data sets that I've come across, I've done searches like, oh, cancer disease, like disease databases. Uh, the, the, there's a global terrorist database that shows like how many people die in different regions over time. M the majority of what I've seen fits into this model of data cubes and has to do with space and time. Yeah? So uh, in terms of keeping the original data, do you have uh, good facilities for keeping links back to the original data items? The question was, do, you ha do I have facilities for linking back to the original source? Um, well, the way I'm doing it now is kind of uh, low level, requires a lot of grunt work. So for each data set, I'm creating a GitHub repository. And in the readme of the GitHub repository, there's links back to the original data. So that's kind of the facility. I'm not, I, I'm, there's no like user interface for it or really sle sleek uh, kind of thing for it. Just to the paper, but right back to where mm -hmm. it came from. This is true. So the comment was about linking back, like if you see a visualization published using this framework on the web, you, want, you would want to know, should, can I trust it and be able to get back to the original data? And so I completely agree. I completely agree. I'm just kind of trying to figure out all the little steps in between to make the system work. Like, I haven't really got to that level of polishedness. So data integration is a big field. Um, data warehousing, like a lot, of, a lot of work has been done in this field. But from what I've come to know, the main issues are schema matching, meaning like reconciling when two columns in two different data tables mean the same thing. Like, 
if they express population, for example, but one is in billions and one is in millions. Like, so schema matching is like this addressing the scale difference. That's how I view schema matching. And then there's data matching, which is matching up which elements in data from different sources refer to the same things. So if you have like Massachusetts spelled out in one data set and then MA in another data set, and then in another data set you have like one, two, three as like some code for Massachusetts. Uh, these should all be able to be integrated together so you could visualize the combined data. So I'm going to run through these concepts. These are concepts of this framework uh, that are like fundamental for representing data. So, so a dimension, we've kind of already talked about, like for example, space is a dimension, time is a dimension, gender, ethnicity, religion. Um, any, any categorical way of binning things. A measure is the aggregated value. It's like the aggregated attribute that, that gets produced in the data cube. For example, population is a measure. Or the gross domestic product of a country is a measure. Or the number of people who die of a certain disease is a measure. And then a cube, a data cube, is a table where some, some columns are dimensions, represent dimensions, and other columns represent measures. So for example, one example cube is you know, these four facts taken as a group. The pop, you know, population in 1970 of different countries. This is a cube. And an observation is one fact from a cube. Like the population of India in 1970 was 555.2 million. Um, a cell in a data cube is a, a combination of elements from dimensions, and those those elements in dimensions are called members, members of dimensions. That's just the terminology people use. So a member is, for example, India or China of the space dimension, or a member of the time dimension is 1970-2010. Um, so a cell is a combination of members from different dimensions, one from each dimension of the cube. So a cell would be like India in 1970 is the cell. So a data cube can be thought of as a mapping from cells to values for measures. So st the cells are kind of like the keys. If you think of a data cube as a, a key value mapping, the keys are cells and the values are uh, numbers for measures. Uh, and then to deal with the reconciling different codes, like Massachusetts and MA, um, I, I had to incorporate this idea of a code list, uh, or like a key set, people use th that term. But a code list could be like country names or United Nations country codes. Um, so just different vocabularies that people use to refer to the same entities. These are code lists. And a code is, is one particular string you know, a set of sequence of characters in a code list that refers to one entity. So, for example, India, spelled out, is one code, but in another data set it might be just IN, is the country code. And then a concordance is a data table that declares the equivalences between different codes from different code lists. So in th this is an example of concordance where the whole table here is, is the concordance that says India is IN, uh, you know, the country name China is the country code CN. These are equivalent. So to represent data in this uh, framework, there are data sets. Two kinds of data sets. A cube data set and a concordance data set. A cube represents the actual data that's in the data cube using codes to refer to the, um, the members of the dimensions. And a concordance data set just defines the equivalences between codes from different code lists. And taken together, they can be used to s integrate two cubes together that may use different code lists. So each one of these data sets is comprised of a table, which is like the core data of it, and then metadata about which columns represent dimensions and which columns of the table represent measures. So let's go through a few examples. So here's a population cube data set where the table 
is this table here. It's country, bunch of country codes, a bunch of years, and population values. But notice that the, this table itself, it doesn't tell you what code list is being used. It's just, you know, it's just an attribute name, like in a database. It's a, it's a column name. You don't know really what it means. You have to look at some external documentation. Uh, and pop, it just says pop, but it, you don't know what units it is, what the scale is. And that's why we need this metadata over here. Uh, so the dimensions metadata, it says here that the country code column represents the space dimension using this code list from the United Nations. It's called UNM.49. It's a particular code list that they've established for referring to countries in their data sets. And then it says the year column represents the space dimension using a code list that's just called year. I'm just calling it year. It's just the, the year spelled out, like 1970 or whatever. And then the measures metadata says that the pop column refers to the measure population, which may be referred to by many other data sets but using different column names. Uh, and its scale is in thousands. So one, a, a unit here represents a thousand people. And here's another example, uh, gross domestic product. It's the same structure, but here it's using, um, see up here it was using country codes from the United Nations, but in this other data set it's using country codes from uh, the ISO group, ISO, uh, Inter International Standards Organization. So they have their own country codes. And it has GDP. And again, it, ha it says, which columns refer to which dimensions using which code lists. So using this metadata, the system will be able to integrate the data together. Um, but it needs to know what codes from each code list correspond to which other codes. So here's a concordance data set representation where the table has entries for each country and it just says India equals 365 as this country code. and then. There's only dimensions metadata for this because there's no measures represented. Uh, and it just defines, like, the country name column refers to space using uh, UN geo name. Country code uses UN M49. So these are the elements that are required to integrate the data together. And the algorithm for integrating it looks like this. You have all these data sets as input. And these are cube data sets. So, so let's say you have three data cubes, three cube data sets that you want to integrate together. Um, and y then you have a few uh, concordances, because maybe you need more than one concordance, because the equivalence between code list A and code list B might be in one concordance, but then the equivalence between code list B and code list C might be in a different a data set, a different concordance. So the way it works is you load all these uh, concordances together and create a, a data structure that I'm calling a thesaurus, meaning uh, what this can do is you give it a code in a code list and it tells you all the other codes that are equivalent to this. And this thesaurus can be used to, to compute a canonical code, meaning if you give, if you, there's a function in there where if you give it a code and a code list combination, it will give you back another code, code list uh, pair that is canonical. So if you give it, like, if you give it MA, it'll give you Massachusetts. If you give it 1, 2, 3, it'll give you Massachusetts. You know, no matter what you give it as input, which code list you use, it'll give you back one, co one code using one code list. So it's kind of canonicalizing them. So they're, they're all using the same word to refer to the same thing. So that's this function, canonicalize cube. It uses the thesaurus to make it so that all the cubes use the same uh, terms, the same codes, to refer to the same things. And then once they're canonicalized, they can be uh, merged together with a fairly straightforward algorithm. It's pretty much a, like a join. And then that can be applied in a, like a recursive MapReduce kind of way. Uh, where merge cubes only ever merges two cubes at once, but the output of one can be used as input uh, to it to another. So this is a, a map reduce kind of pattern where the map part is the canonicalized cube. You're canonicalizing all the cubes, 
that's the map, and then the reduce part is the uh, merge cubes. So this is the overall structure. I mean, I'm not going to go into pseudocode uh, or anything, but this is the overall idea of integrating uh, data cubes together. So as a proof of concept, I took the uh, United Nations population data set that I discussed earlier and a gross domestic product data set from the United Nations, uh, fr sorry, from the World Bank that uses different identifiers. And there was a concordance table published by the United Nations that's, that declared the equivalences between the United Nations codes and the ISO codes. And so the end result is this scatter plot, which shows uh, GDP on the y-axis and population on, on the x-axis as a log-log scale. So this is just a proof concept, proof of concept of the whole pipeline from disparate data sets to a single visualization uh, that shows that the data is really integrated. Because for each country, you need to know it's both the GDP and the population to plot it on this visualization. So that's the universal data cube in a nutshell, the, the whole concept of it. And the other piece of the puzzle, so remember the, uh, the vision here, the universal data cube can integrate data sets together, but then how can you visualize them? This is where it comes to reactive data visualizations. So the idea is to apply functional reactive programming to interactive data visualization. So functional reactive programming, it means that you take a functional programming kind of style where you set up these data dependency networks, and then the system will automatically manage the propagation of updates through, through the system. And so I've implemented this in an open source project uh, that a lot of people have, have actually started using, uh, which is pretty cool. I mean, I don't know, not that many, but a few, which is a lot for me, you know. <laughs> so here's the kind of thing that this can do. So you can define a function, for example, that computes a full name from a first name and last name. This is like a basic example that you see in a lot of tutorials for web frameworks, like if you have a form and enter the first name and then enter the last name, you want to display the full name on the page somewhere, like first name plus last name. How do you do that? What does the system look like? So you can do that with an event-based system where you listen for events, but this is a little bit different. Um, so this is the idea, and I'll show a few of these diagrams, so I just want to explain what it means. So these, these parts are model properties. And a model is just a key value mapping, where strings are the keys, like the properties, and then values could be anything. Uh, it's in JavaScript, so it could be whatever JavaScript uh, object you know, it is. So when you change something, when you change the first name or the last name, this function will execute, which I'm calling a reactive function, and it will set the full name property. So it looks like this. Um, here's a little code example. You create a new model, and then you say, whenever the first name or the last name change, update the full name property to be the first name plus a space plus the last name. And then when the full name changes, just log the value of the full name. And then you set, when you set these two property values, the full name gets computed. And whenever one of them changes, the full name will get computed again. So this is the basic idea of establishing a flow. And this can be used to create um, data visualizations. So here's what that diagram looks like for a bar chart. Um, so this is building on D3. So I just want to talk about D3 a little bit. D3 is a really amazing JavaScript library for data visualization. And it has all these examples tons and tons of examples. And people are using this a lot in industry. Um, but the issue with the examples is they're all like hard-coded to one particular data set, and they're not really reusable. And there was no clear path, like when I started learning D3, there was no clear path to make reusable interactive visualizations uh, that performed well and were like clean on the inside and could work with many data sets. So what I'm doing with this model.js library is basically providing a path to create reusable modules from the D3 examples. So eventually one day you could have like 
many, many visualization techniques available in this uh, framework. This is the model of a bar chart. So you have the size, like the size of the page, and then the margin, like how much the visualization is inside the page. And then whenever any of those change, it should update these other properties that then propagate through and get combined with the data to produce the scales, like the X scale and the Y scale. And eventually they produce uh, bars in a bar chart and also the axes. But the idea is each, each one of these lambda symbols is a function in the code. And so that means the visualization, the whole structure of this flow, which in the original example of D3 is just a linear sequence that's hard coded. And if you update any of the inputs, you have to recompute the whole thing. And I see a lot of people doing that with D3 code and it's very inefficient. So with this approach, you, you only encode the, uh, like the pieces, the dependencies that need to get linked together. So, and, and the system automatically manages the propagation of updates. So the code is cleaner, uh, and it only, update, it only recomputes what is absolutely necessi necessary to recompute. There's no redundant computation in here. Um, so that's the idea of creating reusable visualization modules using reactive programming. This is a bar chart, and it's very similar to a scatter plot. The only thing that would change is this function right here. And so using this approach, reusable subcomponents can be identified and extracted into reusable uh, little modules. So for example, this computes the height of the inner visualization rectangle from the size of the screen and the margin which you see in all the D3 examples as copy and pasted code. It's all repeated code. But using this approach, it can be refactored into a separate library to make the visu visualization code for the reusable modules even smaller and even cleaner. That's the idea. And the same thing applies for creating scales and axes. And this approach can also be used to create linked views, where interactions in one visualization produce some effect in another visualization. So here's an example <coughs> of a scatter plot and a bar chart combined together. This is visualizing the iris data set, which is used a lot in machine learning. So each point here represents a flower, and the flower has a sepal length, which is some part of the flower, some measurement of the flower, and then a sepal width. And you can select the points on here with a brush. This is called brushing, and it's provided by D3. And that defines a subset. So if I just brush over one of these flowers, you see the full data for that flower is displayed in the table below. And then that set gets aggregated, binned, uh, into these different species. Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. These are three different species of flower that each one could potentially be. So this is to demonstrate uh, linked views using this reactive model idea. So if you were to, to show this using the same kind of diagram, this is a simplified version, but the idea is you have a scatter plot model where there's some selected data from, from the brushing, and then you can link the output of that to the input of the bar chart or, or, the, or in the table. You can establish links between the models, between the visualizations really easily. So this is how you can take reusable components and combine them together into visualization systems with linked views. And the linked views are in a way more powerful than individual visualizations because they allow you to explore the entire data set. Um, and this thing I showed you before is also an example of linked views. And I just wanna revisit this with the context of the reactive models. So when I hover here, that changes a model property on the line chart, the selected year. And then that's used as input to define the slice of the data that's on the map. So there's a, there's a reusable component for the map, a reusable component for the line chart, and then there's a main program that just establishes these links. Um, and this is also an example of linked views, this thing I showed before. So, those are the three main parts of what I've wor been working on. So I'd say the contributions are novel data structures and algorithms for 
data cube integration, constructing interactive data visualizations, like reusable components, uh, and then assembling multiple linked views with those reusable components. And I do plan to keep working on this stuff uh, after I graduate. So in the future, I would like to target all these uh, D3 examples and implement them as reusable visualizations. And here I just want to mention there's a great link between the data cube structure and visualizations. So here, here's, I've sort of uh, formalized it here, or not really formal, but kind of. Uh, so a, a bar chart takes as input one dimension, which defines the bar, and one measure, which defines the bar height. So a bar chart can show one dimension and one measure. And a, a pie chart can show the same exact structure of a data cube as input, you know, one dimension, one measure. A scatter plot is showing one dimension. And you know, people people say scatter plot is two dimensional, and it is if you consider a dimension to be a column, but in the data cube terminology, a dimension defines categories, it defines what the entities are. So really in the data cube world, what a scatter plot is showing is one dimension, because it's showing one set of categorical things, and two measures, because the only quantitative values in, in the data cube world are measures. So a scatter plot can show one dimension and two measures. And also you can add um, another measure as size, and you could add another measure as color, to vary the color. Uh, parallel coordinates is showing one dimension. Each polyline is one, one uh, member of a dimension, and it's showing as many me measures as you want, because parallel coordinates, you're stacking the, the axes together, and each axis represents one measure. Uh, and a choropleth map shows one dimension, which is, it can only be the space dimension, not other dimensions, and one measure, which is color. And then there are these hierarchical visualizations that can show hierarchical uh, dimensions, like a hierarchical <coughs> pie chart, which is called a sunburst plot, uh, there's an icicle plot, which is the same kind of thing, and then a tree map, which shows hierarchy. And then, so the idea is you can apply this conceptual framework to create reusable visualization components from the existing D3 examples and other technologies as well, and then link them together with data cubes uh, and visualize all this stuff. And I want to target more data sets. So here's a few other data sets like the US Census, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, the Millennium Development Goals data set, the CIA World Factbook, uh, the Pew Global Re Religious Landscape, which shows the division of religions across the earth. And I would like to add this uh, configuration interface. So I did this little prototype. It's not real visualizations yet, but the idea is you can uh, like change settings of the visualizations really easily in this by just editing a configuration. And ideally it wouldn't be editing text, but but this is the thing the kind of thing I want to go for where users can author their own uh linked views and specify the linkages and specify how the data is shown. Uh, and any user could create that and then publish it easily within like ten minutes. Um, and I've started this project called model Contrib, which is different examples of uh, using reactive visualizations. So when you click on one of these things, you get like this simple demo showing the reactive bar chart and then the code below. So this is an open source thing. I want to try to get people to contribute. Uh, nobody has yet, but like this is the place where I kind of want to pool all the examples together and all the reusable modules together. And Lastly, I kind of want to focus more on like telling stories about something that happened on Earth that can reach people, that can reach people's hearts through data visualization. Like, for example, the Rwandan genocide. I didn't really know much about it, but in uh, 1994, there was this terrible genocide in Rwanda where uh, like a million people were killed. And I didn't really know about that until I was looking at, uh, I was testing out this tool. And I zoomed in to, to Africa. 
and then I notice this little blip in the data. See that, see that line, how the line dips down right there? And I can zoom in and see like, oh, that's Rwanda. And you can see in the data what happened. You know, a million people were killed. So you can see the population drops dramatically between 1990 and 1995. And you can really see that in the, in the data visualization. And when I saw that, I was like, whoa, like, whoa. Like, I was just kind of blown away. Like, I can't believe that many people died in just like a year. But then I noticed the population jumped right back to where it was. So that's kind of strange. Why did that happen? So that's the kind of visual storytelling I want to enable with this technology and put that in the hands of everybody. Because there's so much data out there. All the visualizations have been sort of figured out in terms of, like, they exist as D3 examples. But... I want to let anyone combine data together, visualize it, uh, tell stories, and have some kind of insights. That's the idea. So I'd like to thank my committee members. Um, George Grinstein, uh, he was a great mentor to me. I worked with him for a number of years, and, th and he, he helped get this research started. Um, Karen Daniels helped me. Um, Daniel Keim. Peter Bach, Florian Mansmann. I worked with these people in Germany when I started this conceptualization of the universal data cube, uh, and they helped a lot. And Sam Adams at Rapid7, I worked there. At, at, I had an internship at Rapid7, a cybersecurity company, and, that's, and he let me open source that configurable dashboard prototype I showed you. Uh, that was used in, in the commercial setting. And of course, my family and friends. Uh, my dad's here. I'd like to thank him for supporting me. <laughs> And uh, my girlfriend, Nita. So thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been a great uh, experience going to school here. <laughs>